I know you're probably real. questions period whenever you have to. And then after as soon that, as I get the period. 40 orders that I have written down in I will come in to get some more and after that we'll have our infamous rebuttal period which will consist of your your views on the topic what we have to leave the restaurant at 8 45 and that's a hard that's a hard stop our two speakers tonight the first one's going to be Fran Tobin from the Alliance for Community oh, Services. Tell us the rules. All right. What are the, are there any rules? All right, I'm, I'm just getting to it. I'm going to All right, Charlie will be introducing the speakers. You said no. Charlie will be introducing the speakers tonight. Good to see you, Ken. Now, the rules for the college are as follows. There's only two, and that's one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. <laughs> that's all right, Fran Tobin in the shiny yellow hat, the Alliance for Community yeah. Services, which is a, a, that works for the three million people in Illinois depend on Medicaid and other human services. Following that will be Bill Bianchi, Mark Willage, and Martha White for the JASC. All right, let's go, rock and roll. Let's welcome our speaker. Sorry. It's all yours. All right. That was well done, right? I'll keep a timer. I'll try to sort of keep, keep track. So I understand uh, we're supposed to have about 30 minutes for Roughly. comments and then questions. You do present for 30 minutes. They'll present for 30 minutes. Q&A, then a rebuttal period. Okay, so thanks all for being here and thanks for inviting me. So my name's Fran Tobin. I live in Rogers Park. I've been a Chicago and life and organizer for uh, one sort or another since I was uh, since I dropped out of college because Ronald Reagan was president. And I thought going to finishing my degree instead of, uh, is this not close enough? No, a little closer. All right. We'll see if I, Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have to hold it. I hope that'll work. Oh, that's fine. Okay. About a Thanks. fist away from your mouth is about what the optimal distance is. All right. So we. Uh, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So sometimes people ask, why did you get into this kind of work? Which is what I've been doing for a living most of my life. Uh, and I would say Ronald Reagan made me do it. Ronald Reagan, racist. Uh, person who uh, sold missiles to the, what he considered the evil people in Iran in order to fund the very evil Contras in Nicaragua. Um, I, I stood in cheese lines back then, some of you may remember those days, um, and thought that there must be a better way to try to make change than just being angry about stuff. I should probably be angry but a little more focused. So just recently, Ronald Reagan's been in the news again because the shocking revelation that Reagan was a racist. Imagine that. It was a shocker. You know, this is the guy that invented the whole welfare queen idea, mobilized uh, people, uh, white people, against ideas that, you know, lurk and loom large in people's heads about you know, welfare Cadillacs and all that sort of thing. And I grew up in a very white Irish Catholic neighborhood in Chicago, and a lot of my neighbors eagerly lapped up the welfare queen nonsense, and they, and they worked for them. Um, for reasons I don't quite understand, it never quite set for me. Uh, but I started organizing when Reagan was president, and I remember, this is part of what's hard for a lot of my colleagues who are younger than I am, to realize is that when I started organizing, politicians had to compete about who was going to actually help people more. 
I know, shocking. And I mean, when when Reagan and Bush were once debating, they were trying to out pro immigrant each other. You listen to the debates, and that's their positioning. Now, I was clear-eyed enough, I think, to realize that most of the politicians were not exactly being honest when they said how much they were going to help poor people and immigrants and vulnerable people and people with disabilities. Uh, but they had to say it. They had to campaign on that. They had to pretend. They had to claim it in order to get elected. And now we're at a point where politicians are bragging about how much they can be cruel to the vulnerable, be cruel to people with disabilities, let them die. That's what they actually brag about. Unless they're in utero. Well, yes, there, there's a little carve out there uh, for the pre-born. Um, so I, I say that context partly because I believe in civilization. The things that have been under attack systematically that the Alliance for Community Services, which I didn't mention, that's who I'm working for these days, and I'm supposed to be speaking on behalf of, um, the kinds of programs, universal health care, Medicaid, food stamps, disability services, home services, uh, adult education, English as a second language classes, those are all the kinds of things that we used to call civilization. Margaret Thatcher very famously, long ago, said, there is no such thing as society. And a lot of people kind of shrugged it off and laughed it off. I argue that that is a really deep and important point, because that's the essence of neoliberalism, is that there is no society. There's only individuals that compete for whatever they can get. Because if there is no society, I have no relationship to anybody else. I have, I don't get, I don't give. Society means that there is some kind of collective, some kind of shared space, some kind of interdependence. It's like the factory owner that was talking about, well, I shouldn't have to take tax, pay taxes. I built my own, you know, I built this factory up, blah, blah, blah. And Elizabeth Warren said, yeah, you didn't build all that. You didn't build the roads. You didn't educate all the, the people that did all that work. You can't build what you built without everybody else helping to build. And that's society. And that's what we all deserve. We used to be proud of civilization. We used to be proud of taking care of other people. And now they're competing to try to take health care away from folks. So the alliance comes from that perspective. So for folks who aren't with us on that, you know, we're, we're not going to agree. But the starting point for us is that every person deserves dignity, deserves the opportunity for a full, engaged life. There was a, used to be an ad campaign on TV a long time ago. Uh, Tony Danza from Taxi or some other show, I don't remember. You know, he's like, so uh, like, how do, you treat, how do you treat a person with a disability? And then at the end he says the obvious, like a person. And that's actually a revolutionary thing for a lot of folks uh, across the political spectrum. When every person is truly treated like a person, we would have a vastly different society than what we do now. So, our coalition, the Alliance for Community Services, came about because Governor Quinn, not Rahner, but Governor Quinn, was closing public aid offices all around the state of Illinois, more than 30 of them. There are now parts of Illinois where people have to travel more than two counties in order to get to an office Chicken, to buy spinach, food no stamp, onion. or handle Thank a problem. You. What do I owe you, Greek Peter? Yes. That lack of access and the creating these barriers has become the norm for all kinds of public services. So public health, public nutrition program, public education, public transit, all of these things have been put on the chopping block. All of these things that used to be civilizations. So Quinn was closing all these, these human service offices, also known as public aid, and some of the workers that worked in one of those offices thought, you know, we don't want to just let this keep happening. We want to fight back. But we also need to know, you know, we're not losing our jobs. We're just going to be moved. But the people that we sit across the table from, folks that come into our office, we're the ones, we the workers, we have to look folks in the eye and tell them what's going on. And we're the ones who are hearing their stories. We're the ones that know how screwed up it is. And we're the ones that are actually put in a position to enforce what rules that we often think are unfair. So they wanted to work in tandem with their recipients, with the consumers people that make use of these programs. So uh, 
workers that are part of a union, ASME Local 2858, reached out to, well, who are some of the groups and where are the organized folks that are part of this? And so they reached out to groups like Improve and Adapt, uh, people with disabilities who make use of those services. But each of these groups is completely led by the consumers themselves. Northside Action for Justice, which I'm a member of, a proud member of, uh, is also a group that's volunteer member that that's made up of people that make use of these same public services that were being shut down. So the whole idea behind the alliance started around that specific attack on access to these services of let's bring the folks that need these services together with the folks that deliver them and administer them in a way that together we can be stronger, we can be smarter, we can actually learn from one another. Early on in the process, a lot of the folks in the community, when we talked about, look, let's work together with the workers in, in public aid, I mean, their first reflex was, fuck those people, man. They don't care about anything. And maybe that's the case with a few, but once they got to know what was going on, they realized it's actually a very different kind of environment. That most of the folks take jobs in public service because they believe in public service. That's, they actually want it to work. They're also the very ones that very often see up close and personal how things internally are not working. So as one example, uh, under Rohner, a uh, rollout of a new computer system came about, the, it's called the Integrated Eligibility System, or IES. So within a few days of the computer system rolling out, tens of thousands of people lost their food stamps. Eligible people. No, this isn't, you know, the surfer dude out in California that was probably under some right-wing commercial, right, that they, they found some guy that's, that, you know, can sound kind of crazy. But the folks that have been eligible, folks with disabilities, folks who are poor families, because of the computer mess up, and it's purely because of the computer. So first we alerted the Ronner administration that, look, people are getting cut off because we're hearing from the community. Second. Uh, the Ronner folks at first said, oh no, it just isn't happening. So then some of the workers going through the chain of command said, look, we're the ones actually operating the system. It's messing up. It's canceling people that aren't supposed to get canceled. Um, and then they said, we don't care. And then, you know, we made a more, more of a public splash. And so immediately the administration said, oh, it's because of those, it's because of those Poor people, like they're screwing it all up. They're not filing their paperwork on time, and they're they're they've just been you know they've been getting away with stuff for a long time, and now we're catching them, and, and you know blah 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 all this stuff, blaming the poor, blaming the victims. Fortunately, many of those poor people that were losing benefits were in an alliance with the very workers who actually operate, not the administrators. <coughs> the workers that actually operate the IES computer system. So when the administration tried to blame poor people, the workers could step up and say, no, 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 no. They did everything they're supposed to do. The computer system screwed up. Excuse me. Built by a private company called Deloitte for hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Deloitte's been screwing up welfare programs all over the country for decades now. Um, Can I have the list? And so this is one of the examples. Yeah, because the we're able to shame them, we're able to counter all of their claims in putting direct pressure, they eventually did make some changes that then reinstated you know, 40,000 people in their food stamps. They've made some adjustments for, uh, for some of the other computer problems. So people are continuing to this day that computer program is not fixed. There are at least 3,000 known glitches in IES that they have yet to fix. And so the Pritzker administration has this system that they were handed, left, I mean Deloitte took the money and ran, and doesn't really know how to fix it. So they're aware it's a huge problem, um, but it's a lingering case where there's at least 3,000 known glitches. And to this day, folks are losing Medicaid benefits. People show up at the grocery store and find out there's no money on their link card. Not because of anything they've done or their eligibility has changed, but because of a computer glitch that somebody got paid for, paid well for, and yet they are the ones suffering. I put this also in the context, not just of attack on civilization, but on the whole idea of you know fairness. 
So it's been well documented, and I'm not going to go into it for, for now, but we have record inequality. I mean, the 1% is richer, especially the top 10% of the 1%, is richer than I can imagine. And I have a pretty imag big imagination. I, I, yeah, I can imagine a lot. It's more than I can imagine. The kind of inequality we're talking about, we haven't seen before. Um, perhaps rivaled by the, the late 1920s. Um, and in that context, the people at the very top use their excess wealth, the extraordinary excess wealth, to maneuver the laws to make sure that they don't pay their fair share. So piece by piece by piece, they manage to use their lobbying power to buy politicians, to buy themselves loopholes, to buy tax breaks, to buy by themselves, um, various kinds of uh, breaks and cuts and subsidies. Some of us have paid attention a lot to affordable housing. That's not the focus of uh, the alliance, but a couple of our groups do a lot of work on affordable housing. You may know that rich people in this country get about five times the subsidy, housing subsidy, that poor people do. Yeah. The inequality, I can. I can walk through all that. Uh, I didn't bring my stats on that, but absolutely. Um, the inequality gives them the advantage to then remake the laws. So here in Illinois, for example, we have one of the, the fifth most regressive tax policy in the United States. So by regressive, I mean rich people pay, pay a lower percentage of their income than poor people do. So if you look at all state and local taxes, which is what all public services are paid for, whether it's the library or the city or schools, public schools, um, state government, all the various things that are public dollars pay for. Rich people pay um, only a third the rate that poor people do. So poor people are getting the least and they're paying the most. And in the context of getting the least and paying the most, the very services that are supposed to be about the safety net, supposed to be about civilization, are being yanked out from under them. So whether it's a tax on food stamps that the Trump administration is doing, that the Russia administration tried, um, Trump's trying to uh, add a new feature that in order to qualify for food stamps, you have to have a job. Uh, it's just right, because, you know, obviously, why not? Now, the fact that Illinois has the highest African-American unemployment rate in the country means that in reality, who's being hardest hit by such a policy? People of color, black people. Is that a surprise, given who these folks are? No. From Reagan's welfare queens to Trump's attacks, to Ronner's attacks on uh, Medicaid and food stamps, there's always been a racist overtone to tax on the public good and on any kind of what we would call welfare. I don't know about you, but I remember in our Constitution it says that providing for the general welfare is actually one of the purposes of government, and I believe that, and I hope that we continue to do that. A few other aspects of what's happening uh, that we've been dealing with. So I mentioned that our political coalition started because the Twin Administration was shutting down uh, human service offices all over the state. The most recent one that was lost it was under Rahner, shortly before Rahner left office. Um, in the north side, kind of uptown Edgewater area, they shut down an office in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, mixed income community. And they moved it so that the local office is now all the way across Chicago, uh, west of Cicero, west of Cicero, uh, uh, at 6200 North. So a neighborhood that is twice as wealthy and predominantly white. Now, okay, can we understand that this is not race neutral? It's not only hurting the people that need the services most, it's selectively taking services away from a multicultural, multiracial community and putting it in an area that's white and wealthy. At this point, our uh, current Department of Human Services Secretary has made a commitment to work to replace, to bring back a, an office in that community. She made, a, made that commitment at a 
town hall forum in Uptown a few weeks back. So that's definitely a good step. Uh, but we've got a lot more to do in terms of having access to these kinds of things. Thank you, Jim. The attack on public services is beyond what we typically think of as the safety net. So many of us here pay a lot of attention to public transit. I'm not going to go into that at the moment, but clearly there's been uh, between uh, starving the public sector, which is part of their strategy. You may remember Grover Norquist said he wants to shrink government to the side and you can drown in the bathtub. If they shrink government, they make it fail, so it can't do the work, and then people get pissed at each other because it's not doing the work. And the central strategy of the 1% is to have us, central, central strategy of the 1% is to keep us fighting each other. They want those of us without pensions to hate those and resent those that have pensions. They want those of us that um, can walk to be resentful that somebody in a wheelchair you know, gets a parking space. Um, this, they want white people to resent black people. The list goes on. As long as they can keep us hating each other and fighting each other, they're going to stay. They're going to stay where they are. And they know it. They're hoping we don't. That attack goes beyond just those kinds of services. So we're looking at uh, city colleges. So the mission historically of city colleges was the whole idea that anybody that needs education, you know, in a lot of ways, this fits into the neoliberal conservative narrative. But as often is the case, they, they like the narrative. They don't necessarily like everything that goes with it. So English is a second language. Folks that come to this country um, seeking refuge for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> City colleges have been the place free of charge to the consumer where they get to learn English. They get to get their GED. They get to be able to start the ladder of processes in this society where they can you know get a piece of the rock so to speak so what they've been doing what they've been doing throughout has been mechanizing and uh, corporatizing city colleges so they've shut down and privatized several uh, community outposts there have been several of these community uh, outposts where folks could take classes that were publicly owned, publicly controlled, um, free of charge, and so they've shut those down, sold them in some cases to private developers who are gentrifying the neighborhoods. In some cases, they've sold them to private schools, which, I mean, you're just trying to think. There's a, there was a plan to take one of the public buildings and sell it to the private school that the current chancellor used to run. I don't know if there's any relationship between those two things or not. Um, uh, not sure if that's actually where that stands, but folks are fighting back. Not too long ago, after five years of the adult educators at city colleges trying to get a fair contract, they announced that they're doing a new curriculum. And so the administrators, who you may, it's hard to remember, like, they don't actually teach the SL classes. They, they Something to drink. Uh, they Water. decided they wanted a new Be curriculum, the cream of and they ordered every teacher to garbage. have to follow it, including yeah, getting rid of any other materials they yeah. ever used, yeah. including getting rid of the textbooks they've been using for years, and uh, claimed, of course, as they always do, this is to improve, it's to improve, to reinvent. There's always this, you know, public housing. We're going to reinvent public housing by making it go away. We're going to reinvent city colleges by cutting all the ESL classes, which is what they've now done. They're proposing to drastically slash ESL classes at the exact time when uh, immigrants are coming to this country and have a need for exactly that, the kind of thing that many people are saying, yeah, folks should be doing that. And we're taking away that opportunity from them. From them. At one point, the administration actually went in, actually went into people's lockers and took all their books they said, no, you can't use any of the materials, you teachers. We would argue that apart from the, being a big problem for the program, this is part of taking education and trying to turn it into a corporatized, privatized product, where teachers are treated as cogs in a wheel rather than educators. The whole idea of 
academic freedom, the ability to actually use creativity and engage students in a way that best suits them is a, one of the other pieces that's being taken away. In education throughout the country, teaching the test, teaching, teaching to make sure that the test makers can have contracts to have more testing, et cetera, et cetera, that's all been part of the, the push. And so that has gone into our city colleges as well. So the whole push, obviously, is broadly speaking, taking away things that were about the public good, that were about decency, that were about civilization. And the idea, I would argue that part of the idea is that you and I may not have the exact same needs. So why should we be getting the exact same things? We should have access to what it need, what we need in order to fulfill our lives. That's the public good. That's emphasizing the public interest and the public good, not the private interest and mostly profits. So coming up, there are a couple of things uh, that folks probably know about. There is a proposal that's going to be on the ballot for what's often called the fair tax. It's a graduated rate income tax. Even adopting that. Um, to be clear, you know, we support that. That's a good thing. That's an important step. The Frontier administration supports that. I think that's very important. Um, even if adopting that, Illinois will still be a regressive tax state. So even with doing that, because the rest of our taxing system, between sales taxes and property taxes, for example, are still mostly hitting people in the low end of the income spectrum, or folks that don't get as much out of the economy and yet are paying more of what they have to keep it going. Um, so those are my uh, meandering comments about you know, the Alliance for Community Services, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I would close with, with a fairly basic political note, which is the 1% win because they have power. They use their money, they have power. They use their money, they convince us to fight amongst ourselves, to be resentful of one another. Well, that guy got something that I didn't get. You know, it's like the person who's mad because I didn't get a free college education, so why should anybody else? It's like, well, there's a lot of things I didn't get, that I fought for, that I scraped for, that I hope other people don't have to. If we truly can't, if it's truly something that we're not capable of doing as a society, that's a different question. But what we know is that we have the wealth, we have the resources, without a doubt, to provide for everybody's needs. And politically, we need to be organized, we need to be more united. When we look at numbers, just as an example, one of our constituents, so the people in the Alliance are people with disabilities, they're seniors, they're poor families. So just looking at Medicaid, for example, you know, there's one and a half million households in Illinois that use Medicaid for some of their health care services. I'm one of them. Imagine if we had one and a half million people who understood that this public service was vitally important to them and to their family, organized and on a list and having meetings regularly, and talking about assessing policies and and holding politicians accountable. Now that would be some power. That would overcome a lot of what the 1% can do with their money. Um, currently, if we look at organized populations, we don't have as much, and that's part of why the right wing has gone after unions, because it's an organized background, backbone for the progressive movement in the country. The less there is, the less there is to stand in their way. Um, so I would argue that it's not just about which specific issues we're working on, but as an approach to the issues, building those kinds of alliances, bringing different constituencies together. And also, besides being stronger, I would argue that we're smarter because by talking to each other, we learn more about what's working, what's not working, it broadens our view, just as the lively debate that will happen in this room in a while makes us all a little bit smarter, I think. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Thanks for letting me share a little about what the Alliance is doing. 
Oh yeah, and of course we have raffle tickets because you know doesn't everybody? Um, all right. Thanks. Woo! All right. Thank you very much. That's good. All right. For, for 10 years at least at the college here, every year I would sell tickets to save the kittens at the shelter, the raffle tickets. And in those 10 years, the only person who ever bought a ticket for me was my girlfriend, Lois. But, <laughs> But the, uh, the Alliance is having a raffle. They look like this. So uh, don't wait to be approached. Go see the guy in the shiny yellow hat. And I'm just make a little contribution if you want a raffle ticket. That's fine, too. All right, let's hear it from Bill and Mark and Martha to tell us all about it. All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for having us here. I'm Bill Bianchi. I'm with the uh, Jane Adams Senior Caucus in the Illinois Single Payer Coalition. And joining me, I'm Martha White, also with uh, Jane Adams. And Mark, um, oh, there's Mark. Okay. And um, we, uh, we're here to uh, talk about uh, the Medicare for All bill that is in Congress right now, it has over 100 uh, Democrats signed on to it. Uh, talk about what it is, its features and benefits, and why we urgently need it. Okay, this presentation is part of the Jane Adams Senior Caucus Medicare for All educational effort. We're trying to reach out to all kinds of groups, seniors, uh, community groups, unions, whoever wants to hear about it. And we're going to get started. Actually, Martha's going to get us started by asking you all a question. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, what problems are you having with Medicare or your health insurance company now? Would you please break into pairs of two, with each person taking two minutes to give his or her account to the other person? And then we'll take three or four people to tell us what issues they discuss. So if you could start that now, that would be great. Thank you. No, just if you're a vet. Okay, that was two minutes, so the other person now talks about their problems in coverage. Let's have order, please. Let's have order, please. They're ready to resume. We're going to get just three or four people to tell us what they discussed. If you'd like to put, if you'd like to hold up your hands, I'll call on you. We'd like to get order again, please. Hello. Order. Order! They're ready to start again. We need three or four people who want to come up and just briefly speak about their things. Come on up. All right, again, we need order. Thank you. All right. Who needs a box here? Okay. All right. Just, we're going to be talking a little bit about our uh, medical stuff. Who needs the box? My, my uh, bro bro brother it has Parkinson's and he goes to the hospital the frequency at the University of Chicago, St. Joseph, uh, Mercy Hospital, he lives in Hyde Park. And Medicare pays very well. They, they pay, and he has, he stays in for a month. I got it, Nelson. You just need he just to got out 60 days in the rehab place and they pay for everything. Not only that, but Medicare will pay for uh, home care. When he goes home, they're going to send an uh, MD at home. They send therapists, and they send nurses. And uh, uh, Medicare is great. And uh, uh, with Medicare for All, they, it's automatic. They eliminate your private insurance. Thank now, he has Blue Cross. I, have, I would lose my Blue Cross, plus it would take a long time okay. 
for Medicare for All to, to treat us. They, 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 because uh, that's the way it is in Canada and, and England. They have to wait a long time for medical care because they have the socialized medicine. Next comment, if we have one or two more. So waiting time. Can we get one or two more, please? We will in a minute. We're, this is part of the formal presentation. We need one or two more to highlight their me medical problems. I'm on Medicaid. I'm on Medicare. And I have a supplement on Medicaid. Quiet, please. And, um, so I went to get a shingle shot. And... Um, I had to wait a long time. Finally, they called me in. I went in. And um, they wouldn't give me my shingle shot for less than $170. Yeah. And I thought, you know, the flu shot was free, the, the uh, pneumonia shot was free. You go in for shingles, and they say $170. And I called my supplement insurance. I called Medicare. I wrote a letter to my congresswoman, um, but I still had to pay the money. And then the other people in my group said that um, her relative had a malignant kidney. And so she had her kidneys checked out, and they charged her on the basis that it was not medically necessary. Okay, I can add that, not medically. Okay. Here comes Norma. You know, when, when uh, they refuse to pay Use the stuff, mic, please. When they refuse to pay for stuff at Medicare, then the, the, the uh, supplement plan doesn't pay either. So I call and find out, why didn't you pay? Well, they said it was routine care. It was a coding issue. I called back to the other, to the provider, and asked them to resubmit it with a code that actually works when you have something that they're working on with you, not routine care, and it was all paid for. So sometimes it's a matter of tracking it, finding out why did they pay, and then going back to your provider and getting it fixed. Thank you. But that that. Drug plan, pay, you have to pay 170 for the second, for the uh, two, two, two shots. Yeah, that sucks. That's the that's the supplement for medication. You know, the drug supplement, not Medicare per se. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But it was because it was because Medicare wasn't accepted. Yeah. Okay, Mark. There have been mentions of some serious shortcomings of the insurance, and as much law um, praise for Medicare certainly has its problems under the current system. <clears throat> Let's just uh, touch base on some of the basic serious flaws in our um, health care delivery system. Um, the, um, the U.S., uh, we pay twice as much as the citizens of other of the more well-to-do countries, uh, twice as much, yes. Uh, well, one-seventh of our gross national product does go for health care. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, despite this incredible amount of money that's, that's used, there is 30 million people, are 30 million people not covered at all at this yeah. time, and 45 million people who can't even afford to use the coverage that they've been able to get because of inability to deal with the very high deductibles and co-pays. Um, Bernie Sanders has been quoted, and uh, not saying that you should be a supporter of him or not, but he certainly has a, had a lot to do with the writing of this House Bill 1384. And he stated, and I thought this is nice common sense, do you think it makes sense to pay twice as much per capita as people in other nations and we're the only country in the world of this group that doesn't guarantee health care for all of its people. Um, we do have, after we pay all this money out of our pocket, uh, we do have lousy uh, health 
uh, statistics to show for it, we have a very low or a significantly lower um, mortality rate and um, apparently the maternal and infant mortality rates are on par with Iran and Vietnam. Uh, and as far as longevity goes, we tend not to live as long as people in many other, or at least uh, a lot of other, of uh, the wealthier countries. So we're paying a lot more, but we're getting a lot less. Seven, one seventh of all the money that's handled in this country goes for health care. Another problem, there are multiple uh, insurance plans that are vying for each other and cause a lot of confusion. It's very important to note that Medicare and Medicaid um, have a 3% over, overhead. So 97% of those, of those funds go for actual provision of medical care. You compare that uh, with um, um, compare that um, with uh, private insurance plans. Uh, the CEOs can literally make millions of dollars. One person apparently made in excess of six, sixty million dollars compensation plan for being a CEO. Um, and uh, there's just many, many layers of bureaucracy. And so, as compared to the three percent. Um, um, expended by Medicare and Medicaid, it could be as high as 18, 20 percent for private um, insurance companies. Um, just wanted to ask you, how did... Okay, again, let's keep order, please. How, how do or how did you get coverage for example, employee-sponsored insurance. Did any of you get coverage through that through that uh, channel? Yes. You did, Norma? Yeah, you do. Okay. How about from Medicare? Excuse me. Well, we're all you? probably in Medicare. Okay. Okay. Medicare Advantage. My husband. Okay. Medicaid. Oh. The ACA. Well, only one Did you get your there. coverage through There's the ACA? Obamacare. Obamacare. Self-purchase? I've done that. Okay. And you have no coverage at all? Okay. Um, different coverage means inequality. And Bill, I think you're going to speak to this point. Uh, imagine... Okay, well, so imagine that three... That's for the mic, please. Mm -hmm. Imagine that there's imagine that there's three people going to the same doctor in the same hospital with exactly the same problems. And they get the same treatment. But they all three have different coverage. One is covered by their employer. One is on Medicare. One is on Medicaid. The doctors and the hospitals get paid different amounts according to the coverage. So, um, I'll just continue. So, I mean, you... So those who are paid more, uh, the, the, the uh, patients who come with the better insurance, are there's an incentive there for the doctor in the hospital to give them a little more care and a little more attention. And in fact, what you see in the hospital world today is this competition among hospitals to build these almost resort-like facilities so that they can attract people with good insurance that have the highest paying insurance. And of course that means if you're if you're on Medicaid, you may not get that kind of attention. They may want to hurry you through the system. And this leads to health care inequality. And it's, so it's not an individual thing, it's not a doctor making this decision, it's not the patient making the decision, it's the system that builds that inequality. Uh, do you want to Insurance and drug companies are running. Okay, well, I'll just go. All right, a different payment tiers cause providers to compete for these better patients. It's unfair, it's confusing, and why do we have such a uh, unequal system? Because it's run by private corporations, the insurance companies. Insurance and drug companies run U.S. health care. They run it for their profit, not for our health. And it's crazy how much they make. 
I think um, uh, Jean, uh, uh, Mark mentioned some of the um, uh, um, uh, excess earnings of the um, healthcare executives. It's interesting to compare that the person who's in charge of Medicare and Medicaid, it's called the Center for Medicaid Services, I think. Yeah. They're in charge of all of that. Their salary runs about 300000 a year. Comfortable salary, but they're not that rich. The heads of the independent private insurance, com uh, medical insurance companies, their compensation runs around $20 million a year. How in the world can you explain that differential? It's not that they're providing a better product. Uh, should I continue? Or? If you'd like to. Okay. Your hat too. I thought it was. Um, and just as a, another little fact, over a 10 year period from 2007 to 2017, two of the largest insurance companies in this yes, country spent $65 billion of premium money buying back their stock. So that shows you how much uh, of the the cost is driven by the needs of corporations to make profit and to compensate their executives. Now, insurers, of course, they want to make their money, and they do it by controlling, uh, they setting up barriers to care that slow us down from getting the care they need. And these ba barriers, I'm sure you're familiar with them, high deductibles. Deductibles for the ACA are out, outlandish, I mean, as much as $6,000 a year. But even employer-sponsored insurance, deductibles run from $1,500 up to $3,000 or so. So that means you pay the first $3,000 out of your pocket. And this makes people think, you know, it, my heart is hurting, but I think it'll be better tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend I'm not gonna spend that $1,000 and get it checked out. Um, yes. And then another way of uh, slowing down coverage is something called pre-authorizations. You know, there's a woman uh, who wrote a book about American health care and said pre-authorizations originally were a good idea. They were for experimental drugs and highly, highly expensive uh, treatments. And the insurance company would have to, you'd have to call the insurance company and say, do you cover this? Well, now everything is subject to pre-authorizations. You can get your toenails clipped. And that will require the doctor to call up the insurance company and say, is this covered? Now, because there's so many thousands of different plans, there's no way a doctor can know whether or not your plan covers this tr test or this drug or this treatment. So they have to hire people who do this full time. Uh, hospitals have hundreds of these people working for them. And every doctor's office has at least one person who has who has that responsibility, and usually it's more. Another way for them to slow things down is simply deny your claim. Now, we just heard something about it, you know, then you call them up and then they try to make it. But this is not accidental, it's part of the plan. They figure if we deny 100,000 claims this year, 75% of the people are going to call and complain, and then we're going to let them, we're going to cover it. But 25%, 25,000 people won't. And then we don't have to pay. And if you figure the average claim is that, you know, when you average it all together, it could be as much as $10,000. Well, 25,000 times 10,000 comes out to $250 million. So you see that insurance company has put aside enough money to pay their executives more by simply denying claims. <clears throat> so all of this rigmarole drives up costs and contributes nothing at all to good health. Um, I think I think Mark mentioned the public administration is more efficient, um, and I, it's pretty obvious that med the traditional Medicare, the administrative cost is under three percent. That is all the things you do that aren't involved in delivering health care. But for Medicare Advantage, the uh, administrative cost is over thirteen percent. <clears throat> because Medicare Advantage is a privatized Medicare. And for uh, uh, just regular insurance that a, a business would buy for the employees, uh, the uh, overhead is somewhere in the area of 15%. So they're spending an awful lot of money because all of these, you know, like denials, you you call up their office, they got to have somebody to talk to you. So, okay, I would also say, and now you'll hear 
some of our Democratic candidates say, you're going to be kicked, uh, Medicare for All will kick you off of your employee-sponsored plan, which you love a lot. I don't love and love. <clears throat> and we would answer that employee, uh, Medicare for All, as defined in 1384, is actually a far superior plan, far superior coverage than any employer-sponsored plan. Uh, for one thing, employer-sponsored plans are expensive. Almost all employees have to pay part of the, the premium. And in Illinois, a family of four would pay somewhere between four to $6,000 a year on their premiums. So that, that runs to about eight to 10% of the average person's wage. But in addition to that, um, you're never quite sure what your coverage is. You don't really find out what's covered and what's not covered until you make a claim. And then you find out everything's covered except this little thing over here, and you have to pay out of pocket for that. Uh, and the final thing is employer-sponsored insurance is only good if you've got a job, right? If you don't have a job, uh, jobs, though, are not stable and they're not guaranteed. Uh, of people, companies go out of business, uh, companies move. My son's company was here for 15 years and then it got bought out by a firm in, in Boston and everybody except him had to move to Boston or find another job. So when they do that, they lose their coverage. Uh, and then of course you could get sick and not be able to work and then when you really need the insurance, you don't have it because you're not employed. So employer-sponsored insurance is really an inferior product uh, compared to a Medicare for all. It's guaranteed for life, and it's unrelated to the job. It's unrelated to your marital status, your age, or your income. Okay. That's okay. okay, we got we got less than ten minutes for you okay. guys to finish. So how is Medicare for all? How will it actually work? How is it going to affect you? All right. First of all, it's not theoretical. It's not hypothetical. It actually exists in many countries of the world. So it's not like we're trying to build something that doesn't exist yet. We've got a lot of models out of there, out there. Uh, there will be only one comprehensive plan covering all medically necessary procedures. No surprises. No need to choose what kind of coverage you're going to have because everything that should be covered will be covered. Uh, it's guaranteed coverage is not tied to a job. That means you can uh, quit or you can become a student. If you lose your job, you still have coverage. Uh, there are no provider networks. We didn't mention that. You know what the networks are. In order to save money, they uh, negotiate with certain doctors and certain hospitals lower prices. And those are the ones you can go to. If you don't go to them, they don't pay. Well, with the Medicare for All, all the doctors, all the hospitals are in one network. And that's, and, that, and that's real choice for you. So you get to choose which hospital, which doctor you're going to go to. It's free at the point of service. So when you go see the doctor, you don't have to pay. You don't pull out your credit card. Uh, like I went to an orthopedic uh, specialist, and before I got in to see the doctor, they wanted to see my credit card. And they ran it, just in case. Uh, the providers are paid equally for service. So it doesn't matter who you are. The doctor and the hospital is paid the same amount for treating everybody. And that means they don't have to compete anymore for the high paying patients. Um, and then prices for prescription drugs are going to be negotiated by, um, by the same group that negotiates for Medicare for all. And they will negotiate with the drug companies. And that will eliminate this, this outrageous price gouging. There may be, still be some high prices, but the outrageous stuff is going to stop. So most important about Medicare for All, the power of the insurance companies will be eliminated. They serve no purpose in healthcare. They're kind of a mafioso. Really. <laughs> so they'll be gone. And these and the politicians who are saying, oh, we don't want you to lose your health care, I mean your, your employer sponsored health care, what they're really saying is we want to save the insurance companies because they contribute a lot of money. To, to both parties. Is Five it minutes. The lobbyist? Yeah. Is it the lobbyist? Five minutes. We'll we'll, we'll hit we'll okay. hit we'll hit questions uh, okay. at question so, time. What, honestly, if there are so many people 
uh, if we had Medicare for all, there would be some people who would lose their job because that what they're doing is unnecessary. It will be unnecessary to have people answering codes to deal with denials and all of that. So what's going to happen to them? Well, in the bill, there is an ample amount of money being set aside for training for other uh, other professions, namely to actually give health care, but also to um, uh, provide for their pensions and to provide for a the time a period of unemployment. So, um, who will pay for the changes made by the Medicare for All Act? Where's the money going to come from to pay for it? Right, that's the question they always ask. Well, the fact is, we have the most expensive health care system in the world. And when we go to for Medicare for All, our total cost for the whole nation is going to go down. So a better question is, who's going to get the savings? Who's going to see their cost, their overall cost for health care actually drop? Will it be employers, because they don't have to pay premiums anymore? Will it be the employees? They don't have to pay deductibles, co-pays, and our premiums. Uh, will it be state governments, because they'll be paying less for Medicare, Medicaid, excuse me. Who's going to get that? Congress is going to decide. Our job is to make sure they don't put the burden on us. We're already paying about two-thirds of the cost of a new of a Medi of Medicare for All program in our taxes. We pay it through for Medicare, Medicaid, and other stuff like that. So where's the other money going to come from? It can come from new taxes. It can come from borrowing. Our government borrows all the time. Or they can print money, which is what they did for the banks, remember? To bail out the banks that printed money. So. Okay, three minutes. Okay. Uh, we, we are planning to urge Congressman Mike Quigley to sign on to the Improved Medicare for All bill. If you would like to help, would you please fill out one of these postcards? And I'll stop by each table and drop some off. Um, in the back, we have a summary of Medicare for All that you might be interested in, a paper that is entitled Myths and Facts about Medicare for All. And if you haven't turned in your sign-up sheet, I'd love to get it now. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Very good. Okay, let's go. Yeah, all right. So it's only for the 5th District if you can sign up for uh, this postcard to Representative Michael. Thank you. Okay, let's go to questions. Okay. I'd like to ask the first one if it's not a problem. The way we're going to do this is going to be in two different groups. We'll have the, the group that just spoke, questions to him, and then we'll bring the other fellow up in the yellow hat later, questions to him. No. No, Charlie. We'll All right. Do. Who's got a question? All right. In the back. Okay. Uh, I want. I got this table here that was handed out. Uh, it's. Uh, it's. Excuse me. Can you? Could you guys? Uh, yeah. Finish your conversation yeah. after I ask my question. Hey, All right. Yeah. Now. Okay. All right. <laughs> Shut up, Charlie. This, this flyer here says Medicaid rule versus election. It's got two tables, two graphs. Medicaid rule versus election, and Medicaid versus election. And I don't understand what this table means. Can you? Can Can somebody explain it to me? Anybody? Yes. Is there someone in the room who can explain it? He needs to know. All right. Yes. That's France. Okay. That's what France. Please do. This was my, five minutes the, one of the final points that I made was about broadly the political twenty-five minutes. Uh, impact of who's being organized who is part of our thesis is that the one percent largely continues to rule minutes. by keeping the rest of us okay. divided. What are the odds? So, so these, What's an odd? AWD is adults with disabilities. So okay. The top graph is by county. Adults with disabilities, and then all adults that currently are enrolled in Medi with Medicaid. Oh. And then the enrolled. third column is the number of uh, votes that Pritzker got in that county. All right. So all the right. point is just to compare numbers so, so of these different. What areas. are the numbers on the y-axis? <coughs> uh, they're thousands. Okay. So this is four. So ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand. Correct. Okay, so in other words, okay, so we got uh, the number of people voting for Pritzker is greater than the number of adults in the county. 
No, the number of adults enrolled in Medicaid. Okay, okay, okay. So that's all adults is all adults enrolled in Medicaid. Medicaid. Okay, so all adults enrolled. So the so AWDs are the disabled, disabled adults, people. Adults. Yeah, I, I get that. Okay, and 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 and. And, uh, and, and, and all adults means all adults enrolled in Medicaid. And Pritzker votes, that's the number of people from each, in each of those counties voting for Pritzker. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Now on the second table. Maybe you could handle this privately so we yeah. can. Yeah, let's get, let's, get, let's get on with the questions. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what, right here. Okay. Go. Hi. What will happen to the lobbyists? Where the question go? is what will happen to the lobbyists? Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering why do we care about Next that? Next question right there. No? What, what would Medicare for all cost? I heard it would cost $1.4 trillion a year, $14 trillion over 10 years. Oh, it costs way more than that. It's, no, right now, this year, at the end of this year, on our current system, we'll have spent $3.7 trillion on our system that we have now. When we move to Medicare, Medicare for all, uh, as defined in the act, we expect this number to drop by 10 or 15 percent for the entire country. So over the next 10 years, uh, there was a, a study done by a conservative group that said that, uh, I think it was Sanders' bill, would, would cost $32 billion, a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, which is actually a savings compared to what we would, will spend if we do nothing. If we do nothing, we'll spend about $45 trillion over the next 10 years. We're going to wind up like Venezuela. Next question, right here. Okay. No, because we can stand, stand up and it's... Oh, uh, print money, but that costs the inflation. Right there. Okay, Spinks, uh, what, what students have this cleared? Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, can I? Loud, please. I, I, I called my insurance company because, uh, because I wanted to choose my my druggist. I didn't want to go to CVS or Walgreens or uh, uh, something right. Whatever it is. And then I called my insurance company because my doctor is not in their uh, in their network. 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 Yeah. network. So I'd like to know what happened to the concept of the customer is always right. I'm their customer and they're telling me where I can spend my money, and I'm their customer. Right. Well, that's the, and the question is, why can't in the current system, why can't you go to the drugstore that you want to go to, or why can't you go to the doctor you want to go to? Because of networks, the insurance companies have set up networks that they do business with, and and they've negotiated lower prices with them. Right there. Yeah. What's going to be done about organizing against? the opposition to Medicare Medicaid. Now, I got teams through, tattooed across my knuckles, but a lot of unions are going to be against it because they manage, you know, multi-million, you know, if not billion dollar health and welfare funds. So they may be op oppositional, the union bureaucracy against the rank and, the benefit of the rank and file of the working class. So, I mean, I think we need to get out ahead of this. I mean, is there any, um, can plan for that? I read. Okay, he's asking. Uh, he, he he's assuming that some unions are going to be against this because they operate something called the Taft Hartley Law. They operate their own um, health care plan funds, and who knows what they do with that money? And they don't want to give it up, uh, which they would have to do under Medicare for all. And uh, your answer. You know, the answer is I, I, I don't know what to say to the unions at this point because they're basically saying we want to keep this for ourselves we don't want other people to have it and that's not a very um, it's not, certainly not supporting the working class so we're hoping that there'll be such a swell from the grassroots that people that will overcome the opposition of uh, people who are thinking more in terms of their own benefit than for the, the nation's right here. benefit. Can you stand up, please? Stand up. Stand up and uh, speak loud. I tell you the number of times <coughs> in which the, the, president, the president who was the president of our local and part of the negotiating team, I would gladly give up that. 
Negotiating the health benefits, you know, under the contract is a pain in the ass. What's your question? So my my, my issue is if we as a political strategy, we were able to explain to those in our union, you know, uh, leaders that are opposed to that, they could take, you know, that that. That money that they're, you know, administering, you know, that those benefits, and and offer higher salaries to their members, which would make a hell of a lot more sense than the system that we have right now. Do you have a continued formal question? No, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Mary, make a question. It is, it is a pain in the ass to negotiate those, you know, those health benefits. So, so actually, actually, comments later. actually, what I'm yeah. hearing, I'm not sure, but Mary is sort of answering your question about what are we going to do. Remind them how difficult it is that health care becomes the major organized uh, negotiating point for a lot of unions. And after after single payer is passed, after Medicare for All is passed, they won't have to negotiate they can, uh, over health care. They can negotiate wages and working conditions and other things that are important. And I want a, a, a reminder to all of the unions who say we need this. In Canada, they, uh, they have a Medicare for All system, and they also have a much greater uh, union density. I think it's around 30%, whereas here in the United States, it's like 8% or 9%. So, Medicare okay. for All is not going to destroy unions. Any others for this group? Questions? Any other questions for this group? Sir, okay. Let's come on up. Okay. Oh, in the back, one question for this group. Yes, well, um, it was uh, somebody, somebody in one of the presentations said, said that the rich get five times the housing subsidy. Of I think that was in Fran's group. Okay. Yes. He'll, he'll, he'll handle that question. Fran? All right. All right. I got a question for you, Bill. Okay. What? Uh, your camp now you're campaigning for for this Medicare for all for the whole United States. Is Correct. that right? That's right. What do you think about the idea of, of trying to get it in Illinois first? It's very difficult because in order to do it in a state. The state has to get permission from the federal government to, to, that they will give them all of the Medicare money. Because you see, we're going to use them and all of the Medicaid money that comes into the state. And that would, that would, uh, that would be a big part of how we pay for Medicare. And the, and the, and the federal government is probably not going to do that. So that complicates the whole job. And it's just better to do it at a national level. And I think right now we have a better chance at the national level. I know it doesn't look so good with Trump in office, but if we can, depends on what happens in the next election. Do any states have it? Wait, wait. Do any states have Medicare for all? I can't. A little bit louder. Loud. Do any states have Medicare for all? No, no. As far as I know, no states have a Medicare. No, they have what they have is Obamacare. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. This is the last one for this group. What, all right. What about the idea, since there are people resistant to Medicare for all, of the idea that you can have Medicare if you want it, by, and, uh, you know, it's going to be so much better than the private health insurance, so much less expensive for everybody. They're going to get it <laughs> okay. as a step. Well, so the question is, is a step is that you don't have to be in it if you don't want to, and that's true. If you would prefer to pay out of your pocket, you can do that. So everybody's free Last to do that. Last one, go ahead. Would I lose my private insurance, Blue Cross, under Medicare for All? Yes, you wouldn't need it anymore. Wouldn't be covering anything. Everything would be covered under the Medicare for All. have less coverage. No, 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 you no. have more coverage. No. All right, There's I forgot a lot more to say people it. in there. It's gonna, it's gonna cover uh, eye, way, eye care, dental care, and most important for us in this room, long-term care. Because right now, the only way to get long-term care from the government is to impoverish yourself. Medicaid, Medicaid. Stop. Stop. Do you right. have a question for this group? Yes. Yeah, I, Would there be oh. any uh, sort of social sanction uh, if uh, private insurance tried to exist after Medicare? 
Medicare's Medicare for all passes. As I understand it, it'll be illegal for them to exist. Uh, to, no, it'll be illegal for them to cover the same things that are covered by Medicare. Who did? For all. They can cover things like cosmetic surgery or you know, ED problems okay. or you know uh, things that are not covered by by the, by the Medicare for all. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Next group. Next group. First question, Cubs or Sox? Question. In the back. Okay. Uh, okay. My question is, how much you said in your presentation that the rich get five times the housing subsidy of people that are not rich? Is that right? Yeah, I think okay. exactly Can you 10. repeat the question? I think the question was uh, that I had said earlier that rich people in this country. Uh, get five times the housing subsidy, only talking about housing, than poor people do. Okay, uh, how, does that, how does that work? Uh, it's basically the mortgage subsidy. So the amount of tax cut that people get by being able to deduct their mortgage overwhelmingly benefits the richest people with the uh, most right over here. expensive houses. So if you compare that dollar amount with the total dollar amount that all poor people get from all kinds of housing subsidies, rich people get, I think it's actually 10, but I didn't have to look that up, but it's substantially greater housing subsidy than poor people. You're talking about all right. the dollar value. Okay. The dollar value, correct. Absolutely. Right here? Okay. Right, you had used the example of uh, what? Of the community colleges uh, being something for the public good that have been corrupted. How can you ensure if we have a Medicaid or Medicare for all system that that too won't be susceptible to corruption and abuse and uh, cronyism? Did everybody hear that? No. Was that if, if some public services such as city colleges are open to corruption, how do we know or how can we ensure? that another public system such as Medicare for All would not be. Is that the question? Yeah. Well, I think it's called organizing, and I think, unfortunately, um, we have a lot of work to do. And the right wing has been actively corrupting a lot of these public services in order to create disfavor among the public. Yes. So yes. you create yes. a system, you make it not work, and then you say, look, it doesn't work, let's get rid of it. So it, it, the answer simply is organizing. Um, within Medicare for All, which I didn't mostly speak about, but, at, but our group actually supports, um, uh, within Medicare for All, there are checks and balances and there are systems that are put in place to make that uh, much harder to do. That doesn't mean we should not have eagle eyes and we should not keep organizing. We still will need consumers to be organized. We'll need all the people that benefit from Medicare for All when we get it to be organized and to have organized voices to hold an account. Okay. Question? Question. Question. If we don't have questions, we go to comments on the other. Charlie? Yeah, the uh, libertarians often speak here, and the Republicans too, and they say we have tax breaks and don't tax the people, that that'll stimulate the economy and and eliminate all poverty in the United States. <laughs> right. And we've been testing that theory for quite a number of years. Uh, I guess we'd have to keep on testing it uh, as far as they're concerned, and maybe eventually when it doesn't work, they'll... Uh, any other yeah, questions for this challenge? All right. Right here. Do, do you think students should pay their student debt? They don't want to pay. Yeah. One trillion dollars. Yeah. Where do you go? Yeah. That question in my organization has never taken it up. Personally, okay. Uh, I think we have a system that is uh, onerous, and we have a system in which we can and should provide education as a public good, not as an asset, as a privatized asset that people have to invest in. So I think we keep drastically revamping the system uh, in a way that, that reduces or eliminates student loan debt would be a really good thing. Okay. Any others? Let's, Where's uh, all the money coming from? Any, is this a question about what? Specific? I just wonder where all the money is coming for. Like, if, if so you we have free public educa uh, college education and free medical Medicaid for all, how do you propose? Is it going to be a, a, a increase in Last question. So we, we, the Alliance, for Can you repeat her question if you understand it? The, the question was, 
everybody always says, well, where does the money come from? If public services have to get paid for it, which they do, uh, how is it going to be paid for? What are the sources going to be? Uh, and uh, the answer is similar to what was said before, is they're, it's going to be paid for the same way they are now, only we're advocating that they be progressive taxes. Right. Public services should be paid for by taxes. That's all they are for. Otherwise, we're turning government into business, and we don't want that. Um, that's a corporate-type state that we definitely don't want to be living in. So by having progressive taxes rather than regressive taxes, and the people that are getting the most out of the economic system we live under are the ones that are actually paying the freight to make it continue to work. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we are working on, Illinois is the fifth most regressive taxing state in the country, meaning that if you compare on percentages, not dollar amounts, that would look wildly different. Just on percentage of income, poor people in Illinois are paying five times their income in taxes in the state. The, per, you know, the percent the rich people are in this state. So if we turn that around so that the people who are actually getting the most are paying a higher percentage, which we call progressive, um, then we would be able to pay for that. There are other tax systems, such as we're supporters of the LaSalle Street tax, taxing financial transactions. So whether it's at Wall Street or the Mercantile Exchange on LaSalle Street, we basically have these big casinos in this country. We have one right here in Chicago at the Mercantile Exchange, where traders, which are really gamblers, big hedge funds, big banks, that's who do it. They buy and sell derivatives, um, often at thousands per second, has no actual net value for the economy as a whole, but has the potential for hugely enriching a very small number of people. If we tax those transactions, and even a tiny amount, a dollar or two per contract, just for here in Illinois, we can generate $10 billion in revenue to pay for all the public services that we've been fighting for. Good public transit, good public services for people with disabilities, uh, health care for all, etc. So it's, it's very doable. There's a long list of ways that we can impose and create progressive taxes. We can close the, some of the loopholes that cost just here in Illinois. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and we can pay for what we deserve. Okay. Do you want to add to that, sir? Yeah, I just want to add. Step, that. To, step to the mic. I, I just want to add that, that we already have the most expensive healthcare uh, financing system in the world, by far. We pay about twice what other wealthy countries pay for healthcare. So when we go to single pay for all, the total bill is going to be reduced. So that just and where it's going to be reduced from is what we pay out of pocket. That's no longer that's going to go away. And as far as if they're how, how they're going to pay the doctors and the hospitals, there's already a lot of money in the system. There's already a lot of tax. I think something like a third, a quarter of the federal budget goes to health care right now. So that's our tax money. So that's going to be redirected away from current systems to Medicare for all, and that will cover a lot of it. The rest of it, if there's falling short. Congress can decide who to tax, who's going to pay for it. Will it be employers with an employer? I mean, like, they could pay a payroll tax. Will it be employees? They could pay a payroll tax. Will it be the financial transaction tax that he mentioned? Uh, will it be, um, there have been a, a tax on assets over two or three million dollars? I know this is going to hurt some of you, but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, and there could also be a high income uh, surcharge or a luxury tax. All of that, Congress will decide, and we have to fight to make sure that the, 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 whatever uh, burden they put out doesn't go on ordinary people, but we're already paying a lot of tax out of our pockets for health care and a lot of social, and not to mention for endless wars. Is that a question or a speaker? I have a question. Do you have a question? Yeah. All right, last two questions and we're done. Who is it for? Uh, my friend from the Alliance. It seems to me that this competition between states to land, I don't know if, you're, if you gave much thought to it, but it seems to me this competition among states to land companies like up in Milwaukee. In the Milwaukee yeah. area, Fox Camp. Yeah. What can we do about that? We're giving away so much. You know, the states are at war with each other, and the big winner are the corporations. 
this because this is not on first because this is an on subject, you can answer it, but keep it short. And can you repeat the question? There's been a tendency for states uh, or cities, but mostly states, to compete by handing out bigger and bigger subsidies to companies in order to quote land the companies in their <coughs> territory, always claiming that in the net overall. Uh, at some point in time in the future that it would create a net economic advantage. Um, and absolutely, that's the claim. Um, so first and foremost, we need to organize. There's th that question has been researched thoroughly for decades, and rarely, if ever, are those deals actually good deals for the states that do them. They are good deals for the executives and the people in charge of the companies, and they're good deals for the politicians that raise money from those executives. So there are definitely people that benefit from those things, but the people of the state as a whole don't. But we need to organize, we need to educate, we need to look more closely through the rhetoric and through the claims that they're making. Last question, Bob. Thank you. I wanted to ask the other and who's speaker. who's the uh, He left. What uh, issues, especially we got in seniors, the Jane Adams Senior Caucus. Uh, Can you take this question? I don't understand the question. Well, okay. Or here. Go. No. Yeah. Can you repeat your question? Uh, this one, uh, wondering which uh, other issues, especially regarding seniors, the Jane Adams Senior Caucus. Can you repeat this question? Uh, yes, the gentleman is asking what other things uh, Jane Adams Senior Caucus does. Can I take 30 seconds? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this is an organization run by seniors for the uh, looking out for issues that primarily affect seniors, but we're certainly interested in the rest of the population, too. And uh, just to mention, uh, we do uh, we're uh, active in economic, housing, and health care for seniors. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Who wants to comment? All right, we can raise your hand if you want to rebut. Let's One, thank two, our speakers. Three, four, five, we will. Yes, let's thank the speakers. Okay, get a count on the rebuttals, please. Rebuttals. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 4, 15. We'll, uh, we'll, go with, uh, we'll go with three minutes each. Be a strict accountability on the clock. We'll go three and a half. How about we'll make it four? Because a lot will be a little shorter. All right, well done. Thank you. Okay, you got four minutes. Here's the four minutes, but uh, try to be considerate of everybody. First person. Go ahead. Thank you to our speakers. So uh, you might ask yourself if these uh, programs and services reflect the values of the majority of 320 to 325 million people in a 21st century country, why haven't they been implemented into law and enacted as national policy? Here are some reasons why they have yet to be the law of the land. Number one, we have unaccountable computer voting machines. Number two, we have big money corrupting elections. Number three, we don't have accurate and nationally uh, required exit polls. Number four, we don't allow third parties with new ideas, such as the great new ideas that have been suggested this evening by our outstanding speakers in the debates. Number five, we have an ancient, outdated, what the electoral college. Number six, we have a provisional ballot system that is a feel-good system, essentially, which tells you your vote was very appreciated, yet not counted. Number seven, we have gerrymandering. Number eight, we have voter suppression. Number nine, we have interstate cross-check that one of our speakers spoke so well on. Somewhere around here. Number ten, we have parties that think they can break their own rules during primaries. Number 11, we have computer voting instead of caucuses. Number 12, we have superdelegates. Number 13, we have political money laundering in the form of fundraising agreements. So uh, if you'd like to get involved with your local grassroots organization, nonprofit, faith organization, do some organizing to change that, uh, we might finally be what we always hear we are on the corporate airwaves, which is... A democracy. A democracy. Thank you to our speaker. Oh.
Sanders, Medicare for All outlaws private insurance, private health insurance. Yeah. 180 million Americans who currently have private coverage would lose it. It makes private coverage illegal, including the health plan you get at your job. Most of the Democratic presidential candidates are for Medicare for All. You get care only if it's medically necessary. Yeah. medically necessary and appropriate. This is, decision is a, 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 done by government bu bureaucrats. They decide if you're going to get this health care. You got it. Oh. The biggest losers are working people, including union workers, people forced out of their health care, uh, including uh, union workers who are forced out of their health care coverage. They'll be standing in, they'll be sitting in line for, for, for care in crowded clinics next to the unemployed. There, there is a $1.4 trillion yearly price tag on Medicare for all. That's $14 trillion over 10 years. Even worse is the human cost. For many types of cancers, the U.S. has the best, has the highest cancer survival rate in the world. Yes. Under me uh, Medicare for All, cancer patients could face deadly delays and no private ins insurance coverage. Heart patients who could benefit from angioplasty have to settle for watchful waiting. And as far as the uh, pharma, big pharma, uh, when, when, when the, the drug first comes out, it caught, like I take Provacol, it was $31 a pill, now it's $1 a pill. Over time it becomes generic. Thank you. All right. Good evening, I'm David Tramp. <coughs> I, uh, I'd like to say something that has not been said this evening in so many words. Uh, they want to get rid of insurance companies and replace it with a <laughs> and replace it with a government program called Medicare. For all. The yeah. fact is that what they really are attempting to do is to accomplish an old socialist agenda. <gasps> no. Stop. Oh, stop. Will you shut up over there? Stop. <laughs> stop. One more time. <laughs> they want to accomplish an old socialist agenda they want to overthrow the insurance companies better yet also known to them as capitalist institutions that's all this is about is to get rid of that which is in the free market and bring about that which is mandatory by the government yeah. making people more and more into sheeps. Yeah, Andy. Uh, you didn't tell that. That's a good thing you told us. I want to thank the speakers. I want to thank the speakers for speaking tonight. Charlie. Charlie. Time. Got the time. I want to thank the speakers for speaking tonight. They covered a lot of good things. You know, and I don't want to repeat it, so hopefully I, I won't try to repeat the stuff they didn't cover. But uh, yeah, I'll, if I didn't hear it here before. Uh, they're talking about outcomes in healthcare. Like they said, they said that the healthcare is uh, we spend more than double than any other country, and, and uh, we're, we're number 37 in results, right? And then Cuba has a lower infant mortality rate than the United States, and they don't have the vast resources of the United States. But I want to make it unequivocal: I'm for single payer universal healthcare. We need when every time they privatize something, the cost goes up. The quality of service goes down because right. they need to spend that money to pay off stockholders and CEOs. And the thing is, when, now when, I, when I asked that question earlier, the union officials and the union bureaucracy have an interest in keeping the system they have now because they manage health and welfare funds that are worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And, and that would be in opposition to the, what's good for the rank and file workers. So it's, you know, individual union officials are only concerned about their own narrow interests might be 
a blockade, so we need to get out in the front and organize in the union like I organized in, in my union. We, uh, we passed a resolution to support single-payer universal health care. So, but what happened in our contract, the last UPS contract, not the current one, but the previous one, uh, they worked in collusion because of the Obama health care bill, you know, Unaffordable Health Care Act, UPS wanted to get out of providing health insurance for the workers because we had a, a, basically we had, it was like a pension. We had a certain set of uh, guaranteed benefits. And then the, the Teamster officials wanted their biggest employer to pay in the health and welfare fund. And their plan, what they just did is lower the benefits. So, you know, so now instead of having UPS provide a certain set of benefits, they only contribute a certain amount of money. So we need to get out ahead, ahead of the system, right? And, you know, organize within our unions to, you know, to educate the membership and, you know, make it clear to the misleadership and the union officials that they will at the very least be voted out if they don't support single-payer universal health care. Because, you know, in many contracts, I just posted, just posted recently how they said health care was the biggest issue and, uh, and th that's why they uh, called for a strike vote. And th we can take that off that table and all that money that was negotiated that goes into the health and welfare fund can go into pension and wages because they had to give up for years, you know, they, they have to give up money you know, for pension and wages to go into health care funds. So, it, you know, in this for-profit health care system, it's genocide. Tens of thousands of people die every year because of lack of health care in the richest country in the world. You know, I mean, it's actually the worst country in the world. You know, America's the shit hole. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, questioners uh, had asked, uh, I think half facetiously and half seriously, uh, what will become of the lobbyists? The fact of the matter is that under, uh, under Medicare for All, you're probably going to see even more lobbyists only of a different kind. AARP has its lobbyists in Washington. Uh, lobbying for many programs and many improvements even now, they'll still be on the job. There are a number of other groups that will certainly have their representatives there to make sure that quality care is given to uh, the uh, patients, which is all of us. Uh, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about the lobbyists. We, they are going to be our representatives because it will be in their interests if they want to keep their jobs from to do that. Now, I got to tell you, uh, inequality of care uh, does exist in hospitals today, and I got to tell you, I got to admit that I was one of the people who got the inequality of care when I was in the hospital a couple years ago. Uh, a nurse who happened to be uh, a close friend of mine came by. And uh, before it was lights out and all, why she came by and gave me a very nice kiss. The guy in the bed next to me complained that I had a much better health plan than he did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and they've got the timing down so you can sit down if you want. Okay, um, all right, well, we had a lot of people here tonight. This is really well attended. I guess health care is, I think, a really important issue for people because everybody needs health care. Anyway. Um, I want to say our speaker used, kind of used the term tax dollars to meet public funds. Uh, that's, a, that's very common in public discourse in this country, to use the term your tax dollars to meet public money. It's a false equivalency because there are plenty of other ways to raise, for, there are plenty of other ways for the government to raise money besides taxes. I'll give you an example. In Canada, uh, the, the Canadian government owns its own railroad called the CN Railway. Uh, and and uh, they, they run this railroad for profit. They also even own hotels, which they also run at profit. So they raise money, which they put back in, which they put into the treasury for um, public funds. Now, in Alaska, they also have an Alaska railroad, uh, and they, they and the, the Alaska railroad, and, and this is in red state Alaska. You know, is uh, you know, with for, home of former Governor Sarah Palin. And the Alaska, and I've been to Alaska, Alaska Railroad is run by the state, and again, they run it at profit. So they, and they use that money to help pay for state services. And the state services are pretty good. Um, they also raise money, they don't have an income tax in Alaska, but they raise money <coughs> through um, 
all mineral rights are presumed to belong to the state. And so anybody that drills for oil or anything of that nature uh, has to pay fees to the state to do so. And, and then they use, that money also goes into the state treasury. Uh, they raise so much money in Alaska that they, uh, they have what's called the Alaska Permanent Fund. They give out a guaranteed annual income. It's not very big, it's just a few thousand dollars a year to every person, every adult who lives in the state. Um, uh, Illinois has some means of raising money besides taxes, for example, the lottery and the toll roads. Uh, now, uh, George was talking about private insurance and, and that where a government bureaucrat will decide what kind of health care you get. Uh, excuse me, with, uh, so with Medicare. With Medicare, a government bureaucrat decides what health care you get. I will just say that when you get private health insurance, a company bureaucrat decides what health care they'll pay for. Yes. Now, um, now uh, to Dave uh, was talking about the evils and wickedness of socialism and that, that if we have... If, if we have public health care, it'll lead to socialism. Yeah. I want, want to say that there is a big difference. Oh, there is yeah, a big difference sure. between between government and private company, a private company that people don't talk about. In, in a democracy, we elect the government. A private company is controlled by its owners, not us. You can always go to Russia. I've said this many times in public, and, and I'm beginning to sound like a broken record. Public services are for everyone. You know, we keep reminding the people who are getting some kind of public, you know, benefit from the rest of the population, as if the rest of us, you know, could not find ourselves in a situation where we need, you know, those services. Somehow that is missing from the debate. The current Medicare, Medicaid system is broken. How do I know that? I was a caseworker. I was a caseworker for over, and a counselor for over 30 years. And I saw firsthand how the system works. So, um, we have starved, you know, public, um, you know, uh, benefits to death by limiting the number of employees, you know, that actually administer to, to the program. And I retired early myself because I conclude I couldn't do this job anymore and do it in a way that will serve the public. That's why I went into you know, into uh, those kind of programs to, to begin with. And, and other countries around the world kind of disprove the Kool-Aid that has been permeating this country for at least the last 40 years. That is, if you supply a benefit, a public benefit that you are somehow, you know, that provides a disincentive you know, to the people who receive them. In an article that I read in the New York Times this morning, that is simply not the truth in Denmark and other European countries that have, that have you know, a, a single payer health care system. When you figure the deductibles, not to think of what they don't pay for, and as someone who administered the Medicaid program itself, there, there's a little surprise for you, Wade, when Medicare only covers nursing home care currently for, for two months. After that, you get on Medicaid. What happens, they look at your assets and upon your death, yeah, the state is, is, is there waiting to take whatever assets you have. Either way, you are paying mucho bucks. I think the, the most extreme example I came up, I had a client who was waiting for years. Okay, I'll finish it. Um, until she finally qualified for SSI. Within three months, she was dead. Okay. That's how the system works right now, and I, and I think it's really a shame, and we need to change it.
Next. Illinois and the federal government are both broke, operating at a deficit, and uh, they're deeply in debt. And I'm skeptical of the government to provide health care in any sort of efficient manner. <coughs> the VA is notorious for uh, substandard care, waste, abuse, and that's a totally complete government controlled model there. Vermont's Green Mountain Care crashed and burned. Finland's health care is imploding. Government health care manipulates prices and thus provides inaccurate signals about supply and demand. I think what we now call welfare would be better administered at the state level, as our Constitution prescribes per the Tenth Amendment. It's easier to administer, more accountable to people. There'll be 50 laboratories of democracy competing for the best healthcare environment. This plan, uh, of course, includes abolishing Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, etc., as we know it. Progressive taxation is discrimination. Governments, because they operate on a coerced, shut up, one full at a time. <laughs> one full, because governments uh, operate on a coercive basis, they should treat all citizens equally, including, uh, including taxing its citizens' uh, income at the same rate. If we are to have an income tax, it should be a flat rate and at a very small percentage. I suggest 0.01% because 0.01% of a million is a greater amount than 0.01 of a couple hundred bucks. Also, we need to vote no on Pritzker's tax hike. Uh, using the force of the law to extort the fruits of your neighbor's labor uh, uh, to fund a government that is uh, running in a deficit and uh, has a growing debt and is corrupt is a morally dubious endeavor, even if for, used for the public good. Thank you. Next. <laughs> so, uh, before uh, the, the speaker started, I, I shared a story at my table and uh, I just thought that the story is uh, All right. applicable to uh, to the topic. So, so there's a uh, a drug about ten years ago. Hey, shh. Hello. Announcement for people talking. Can All right, talk that's outside? one. What? Okay. So uh, about ten years ago, there's some great news. They invented a drug to cure hepatitis C. Did, does everybody? Did how many people here heard about this in the news? I'd love, I'm curious. Okay, so a fair number of people. They actually can cure hepatitis C. Not everybody, but almost everybody, and depending on some uh, other problems that you have. Now, this is great news. So about a year or two later, a company comes along and, and buys out the patent. They pay like 10 million bucks on this. And then they open up, they put out their shingle. So. Is anybody, did anybody read the news on how much this drug costs if you have hepatitis C to save your life? Anybody know that? A penny. A million bucks. No, I think it's about $8,000. Uh, multiply that by 10. What? That's right. This drug, if you happen to have hepatitis C, which can definitely kill you, it'll cost you over $80,000 in the United States to pay this. Okay, there's, this is in the news, and you're welcome to Google it. This is true. Now, now this is uh, absolutely shameful, and everybody was outraged about it, but here's the problem. Nothing was done about it. There's no law that says that a corporation can't buy a drug that can save your life and turn around and extort you for as much money as possible in order to save your life. There's no greater fear of being alive than of dying. This is outrageous. And nobody in Congress stood up and said, we can't let this happen. Now, there are other countries, they've decided to do stuff, okay? There are countries that said, we're not gonna let you charge that much. And they've greatly reduced the price that uh, Americans get screwed by. In India, they applied for a patent, and India said, no, we're not even gonna give you a patent. And so, fuck us, fuck you. Great. So how come this is this is happening? How come 
Republicans and Democrats aren't doing something about this. And this is my theory on it. If we pass a law that says you can't charge, we're going to tell you how much to charge for this drug. That's a precedent. That means Congress can tell drug companies how much they can charge with their drug. And there's no corporation and there's no politician that's going to go along with that. And there's no corporation that's going to let you pass a law that tells a company how much they can charge for stuff. So now they're basically painted in a corner because good old corporate America, hello libertarians, thanks to capitalism, they can totally extort you to save your life and Congress ain't going to do a damn thing about it. This is the problem with health care and it's a problem with, with corporations in this country that are out of control. I'm not against competition, but there's got to be a, a common sense, reasonable control on competition so they don't turn around and drive you to an early grave to pick the pennies out of your pocket. Okay. And I got. I, exactly. Okay, it's my turn. Healthcare is really tough. People are brain Um. So I'll just run over some of, some of what I'm calling facts. Sweden is a very non-progressive taxing state. Okay. I mean, every people always. A lot of people compare to the, to the Swedish wonderful health care system, which could be true, probably is true. Their average tax rate is 25%, not progressive. They have a value-added tax that everybody pays. It's not like here where we don't put tax on food because it will hit poor people more disproportionate. No. Value-added tax. Everybody pays it, 25%. Right? And why do they do that? Why do they keep up with it? because they get free health care and free education through college. Okay? So it's like it comes out of your, everyone's pocket, but everyone gets, gets the benefit. It worked over here. Over here, harder so. The other thing uh, to bring up to you is for the last 12 years of my working life, I'm now retired a little bit, I worked at Mount Sinai Hospital. Mount Sinai Hospital is a wonderful place. Okay, the doctors there are all on salary. The doctors are not in medical groups. Okay, they're all salaried physicians paid for by the hospital. All right? It is one of four hospitals in Chicago land, Chicago, that has a um, level one trauma unit, emergency unit. Now, I was working in the OR. I was a locksmith there. I was working in the OR one evening. I had to set up evenings because that's when, during the day, everything was scheduled. And in the evenings, I found out that I was the only person working in the OR. And I was like, what the, uh, there's these doctors here, there's these nurses here, they're all hanging around, having a, I am, why am I the only person working? And then I remember, it's because it's level one trauma. They have to keep these people on staff, on call, 24-7, because they're level one trauma. Okay? Um, wonderful place. Okay. Um, what else? Regarding the national health care, and I've got a minute and a half left. Regarding national health care, what I read about the Swedish system is that it's really not a national system. There's a lot of little systems, and also that um, private insurance is also available. Okay, if you if you want to buy private, you can pick it up. It's probably something like uh, we have here with supplemental. I'm not sure. Okay, but over here, I thought, you know, a nation and Europe. People say Europe is a nationwide. No, Europe. Germany has a system. Maybe but France has. Italy has. Spain has. All these much smaller places have systems. So I thought. Over here, we should do something like the Federal Reserve, a federated system. Over here, like New England, should be its own little health care unit, all right? Maine to Massachusetts, Vermont, that, okay? Then you have the Atlantic states, and then you have, like, the mid-Atlantic states. And you have the South, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, places where these people have similar diseases, similar, similar climates, 25 seconds, okay? Do the Pacific Coast, do the 
Texas in a, in a world all its own. But break it up into smaller federated things so that people have a little control over their little world, over our world, and maybe then we can get over this bridge. But um, healthcare, as it's run here, very tough. Don't get sick. Yeah, decentralization. Okay. All right. Your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I love the nanny state. It's awesome, I trust it. If you want to know what privatization does, recall back 10 years ago when you paid 25 cents to park on the street for an hour, and now it costs you about $5 to park on the street for an hour. Private company in Spain, New Zealand, Australia, Wall Street, collects your you know, you're parking on the street in the city of Chicago thanks to Daly and Ron and all those other crooks. So yeah, I don't I don't like privatization at all. Hey, you know, we're a socialist country already. I mean our fire department, people bitch about that. Oh the damn fire department's costing too much. Schools all across the state, all across the country are public. Or, uh, you know, the, media, the fake media complains about them. They're fine. I had a kid that went through all public schools. Fine. Very well. So we're pretty socialist as it is. And uh, we have a nice new uh, governor. Nice Jewish guy. Isn't he? Pritzker? Yeah, I like him. He should be president. He just gets in and goes, you know what? We're raising the gas tax 20 cents. Shut up. <laughs> just gets it done. <laughs> you know, nobody's been, you know, a couple of right wing nuts and, you know, the Republicans bitched about it. But, uh, you know, the silly little Rom, he, oh, we're not going to raise gasoline taxes. First thing in the office every year. Hey, we're not. <laughs> gets in, hey, 20 cents right now. And nobody notices it anymore. And it's going to get us out of debt along with a, you know, a couple other specific taxes. So I think we have a really intelligent, smart uh, governor in this state, and he's going to do a nice job. One last thing. Oh, Andy mentioned this little girl uh, that went across the uh, ocean in a boat, Greta, and obviously she knows more about pollution. You know, here's one thing about pollution. I, these climate people, you know, they take up all the space in the room, all the air in the argument. It's climate this, climate. Why don't you just say pollution and climate? Everybody's against pollution. But no, we got to fight this climate change. Al Gore, he's the wisest person in the world. Everybody's climate change, yeah, global smart. change, smart. this and that. Friend of mine. One fool at a time, Cummy. Well, <laughs> this this crowd's gotten rough uh, in the last right year. It's not, only it's not a personal attack, attack. it's true. So, I'm really, okay, he's I'm really disgusted with these climate change people in a way because it's way off in the future and, you know, nobody can say it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. It looks like it is happening, you know, all the evidence. But, you know, you got to associate. We, we got lots of pollution. Look at, right here, there's 10,000 cars. There's a billion cars in the world. There's a hundred thousand jet aircraft in the air right now, belching smoke. So anyway, Greta, you gotta like Greta. She uh, she was protesting a aviation pollution, which is the biggest secret in the world. All the carcinogens and the data they hide from us on that because it's part of the big oil and big. Uh, Into the mic. Because uh, aviation is part of big oil and big war department and uh, big aviation, media, fake news. Okay, that was about it, I think. Nanny State, go, go, go. And I really think the Dems are, Democrats are stupid. They're going to lose the Trump because they don't talk about how, how, uh, how Trump bailed out Wall Street for $2 trillion. Okay, your time's up. In debt. But they're talking about stupid stuff. Your like climate up. change only. All right. Oh, got some. Andy, you got four minutes. I heard to keep it short. Was it my smoke?
Thank you. I thought I heard something. Watch yourself so we can Talk get about pollution, not climate change. Right. There, I put it in a good part of the Mic on. Yo. It's the battery starting to fade away. So. Uh, I'll just speak uh, so you can hear me. Speak uh, louder. Hello. Uh, a couple of things that people, uh, the court, everybody is talking about different branches. It's like the fruits of a poison Let's have order, tree. please. The one issue that nobody is talking about tonight is the concept yeah, but that's, that's yeah, unique to America. No other country in America permits a medical system where the goal is to make to take the maximum amount of money for from a sick person before they die. No, a, a for-profit medical system means no amount of profit is ever enough. That they just had a congressional hearing, and a woman asked a a representative of a drug company he says she asks why is this bottle of pills that cost six dollars to manufacture they sell at eight dollars a month in australia eighteen hundred dollars a month here and the man looked right at the microphone he says well in australia they don't have patent protection there's no there's no the, the, there was another article recently the generic drug companies now are doing studies and surveys among the population to find out what is the maximum amount they can charge for a life-saving drug before the parents will just let the kid die because they can't afford it. It has nothing to do with what it costs. Uh, we're running a gigantic multi-hundred billion dollar a year scam on sick people. That's not happening in any other modern country on the planet. It's illegal to make massive profits off sick people. You treat their illness and try to help them get well, not take the maximum dollar until they die. We have a welfare for billionaires program in the country that is the greatest welfare system in the world. Another thing, you see my head, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I learned a lot in my two years in Vietnam, and I've read everything I get my hands on ever since. I'm in my 25th year as a volunteer coaching 7th graders in Science Olympia. We teach 7th graders. In order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem, and then you have to correctly identify the solution. We're all, you know, we're all nibbling at the bullet, in other words. Nobody wants to bite the bullet and come say, these billionaire owners we're dealing with, they're not just executives of companies, they're killers. They tell us by their actions, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry your kid is dying because you can't afford $20,000 a month for medicine, but I need my billions. It's nothing personal. It's nothing personal that your kid or your daughter or your son or your, your mom is dying, but we need our billions. They don't permit that shit in any other country in the world, any other modern country. And until we address that, we're not going to make any progress on this issue. And that's why Bernie Sanders and others like him are being attacked in the media because they're talking about the root issue of what is decent, what is ethical, what's right. And so that's what's going on. And uh, in, in two weeks, I'll be back with some updated information on uh, Bernie's health. Log on to Bernie's Green New Deal. It, it's about the health care. Everything you were talking about here tonight, solutions are contained in Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal. That's why it's being attacked by the media, because they're going after the, the idea that you can make billions and billions in profits off sick people. Thank you. All right, let's thank both our presenters. Uh, the, uh, let's thank both our presenters. I'll tell you a couple stories. I won't get too intellectual tonight. As a freshman in high school, I joined the thing, this debate society. We learned how to debate, and there's a subject that is chosen, debated nationwide. 
among all the students across the country. And the debate topic that year, in 1967, was should the United States have socialized medicine? And we've been arguing it from all those years since then. I was at the 50th class reunion, and we're still arguing it, uh, which is amazing. Um, another thing I'll tell you about the college complex is that over the years I, I put speakers, and I booked one many years ago that the speaker that said there was an alarming situation in the United States. There were three to five million people without any form of health insurance in the United States. Later on, I had another speaker. He said, oh, this topic was we got 10 million people without health insurance. The last time I visited the issue, the figure was 50 to 100 million. So we're headed in the wrong direction on this. Now, I'm going to help you all out here. And there's four problems here, and they're private sector problems. Four, four people have taken control of this situation, and they are the opposition. You're plotting a lobbying campaign. You've got a first thing you do, and I always do this, is figure out who you have, who's, in the, who's the trouble, who stands in the way of getting what you want. You've got to figure that out. And there's four parties operative here. The doctors and the nurses, Big Pharma, the insurance companies, and the hospital networks. And they're all cleaning up. And we're talking some real money here. Real money. And so you got, you've got, yeah, Community Alliance. You're a little guy, whether you like it or not. The Metro Seniors, a bunch of seniors. You got an opposition. You got money. They got money like we just can't imagine. Uh, now the other thing is, this this the, the libertarian guys are here, but the one solution where this is at, and let's not waste time on this. Let's nationalize healthcare industry, top to bottom. Now what amazes me is I have a background in transportation, and a lot of people don't realize is that there was large-scale nationalization, border-to-border -border nationalization of an industry in the United States already. Does anybody know what that was? The railroad. Railroads, right. In the first war, the National Railroad Administration operated entirely the railroads of the United States. They even had something like, four well, people don't realize this, they had four or five different types of engines that were standardized that all railroads could get if they needed motive power. They got one of those particular engines. No one complained about it. It worked very well. So I'm sorry. It's, there's applications. For example, there's the counterexample, but there's no complaint about the Veterans Administration whatsoever. As a matter of fact, that's why there's opposition to getting rid of it and, and, and outsourcing and contracting it out. Okay, There's Charlie. There's no thought on that. Oh, All right. I mean, what is this? We got time. Uh, All right, but we're done. Anyhow, thank you very much. I hope you learned something tonight. All right. The speakers, speakers get a final rebuttal. Now, who had the best rebuttal? Not you. <laughs> speakers get the final word. Speakers get the final the word. word. That was the best rebuttal. Right. What are you talking about? Speakers get the final word. Anybody from Jane Adams still here? No, they left. Well, I just mostly want to say thanks everybody for being here. What full of time, guys? Happy to have the lively exchange of views. I do think that always helps us to think about other points of view. Part of our philosophy, one of the things I said when I All right, let's give our speaker a chance. Quiet, guys. Quiet. One full. We're organized around the principle of what we call civilization. We believe in society where we actually care about each other and it matters whether somebody else has a decent living, somebody else has access to the medicines that they need, whether they can live independently and have a full life. Those things matter to me because I am a citizen of this society. 
and I want this society to be the best society it can be. There's another school of thought that boils down, really, to a bully mentality. And of course, I don't use that language. There's been a lot of work done to justify sort of private profit as the organizing principle. Um, but ultimately, it's about what can you do? What can you get away with? You can, char you can charge this much for medicine. Why wouldn't you? You can charge this much for rent. Why not? Because you can. It's not that far from just taking food away from somebody because you can. It's not that far from taking over somebody else's country, their natural resources, because you can. I argue that we as a human species are actually making progress, not evenly and not very quickly, but a couple hundred years ago, you didn't have to make many excuses to invade another country, conquer, take stuff for the profit of the people in charge of your own country. Because it was there, you could, so why not? Now, it's not that we don't do that anymore, but now we have to have all these excuses to do it. I think that's good. And I think we need to continue to think about society that cares for each other. It starts with the public good. Public services are not supposed to be efficient. They're supposed to be service. They're supposed to be for the public good. That doesn't mean they should try to be inefficient, but the purpose, they're organized around service, around the public good, around health, education, welfare. Private industry is organized around profit. Private industry is not more efficient, it's just more profitable. If something isn't profitable, they don't do it. And if there's any need for it, then it's dumped on the public sector to take care of. So this claim that somehow private is better because it's more efficient is something that's a faulty claim. But fundamentally, it's about values. It's about who we are, who we care about. I care about everybody, and I hope all of us do too. And that means working together, that means building alliances, that means crossing borders, it means being willing to learn from people in other groups and other constituencies when we need to towards a better good. So thanks all for being here. Okay. With that, we're, we're, we're withdrawn and uh, have a good week, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, how much more for a camp? It's been a long time.